Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of the Scottish State, he, uh, build, building the Scottish State here on the 23rd of June. And I have the great pleasure to have with me this evening uh, Tommy Sheridan uh, to talk about independence and many other things. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see where the discussion goes. But first of all, uh, Tommy, thanks so much for being with us this evening. It's a pleasure, uh, Mark. It's um, very, very important that we maintain these alternative media shows. Um, which give an opportunity and a platform for the arguments for independence to be heard uh, loud and to be spread wide because uh, we know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Um, the British state is going to do everything in its power to try and crush yet again the idea yeah. of independence and they'll do that with a healthy mixture of lies and distortions. So shows like this are vital. Independence Live is vital um, because we need to get a message out to our people. Okay. And I, I, I first wanted to give the plug to the uh, the conference that we at the SSRG, the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group, are holding at the end of July, uh, the, uh, the Empowering the Nation Conference over three days at the Carnegie Center in Dumfriesland from the 29th to the 31st of uh, July. Um, uh, 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 Paul will be putting up a link to that, but uh, please, uh, please join us. And uh, so I just wanted to give the plug for that uh, early on. But uh, so Tommy, how do you assess the state of the independence movement at this time? So we have, we had Alba kind of raising its, you know, be, you know, becoming an entity just over a year ago. It was rejected by the SNP in the uh, Holy Word elections in May of, uh, you know, May of last year. They ran again uh, and they didn't get any, you know, they didn't get any elected representatives. They uh, they ran again uh, this last, you know, just a couple months ago in the um, uh, in the uh, the municipal elections or the council elections. How do you see that? And in my view, I I don't think. Nicola Sturgeon would have made the announcement on uh, the referendum if it hadn't been for Alba. So uh, I know it's a very, very broad question, but uh, address it as you as you want. I think it's without to doubt, Mark, that uh, Alba have played a role in pressurizing the SNP to act. The SNP, let's face it, since 2015 have won every single election a British election, Scottish election, council election that's been held since the last referendum um, of, of 2014. They've won the 2015 election out of the park. You remember 56 yeah. MPs out of 59. And it is interesting to, to remind everyone, Mark, that up until 1992, you can go back and check it, the SNP manifesto, and delivering independence was very, very clear. They stood at that general election and they said the way to deliver independence is to send a majority of Scottish MPs to Westminster. And once you've done that, that will start a 12-month period of negotiations to build the new Scottish state. Um, so separation was built the day after the Scottish people sent a majority of MPs to Westminster who believed in independence. And ironically enough, that was Mrs. Thatcher's, and I'm sorry, swear yeah, yeah. Show by mentioning such a name, but that was Mrs. Thatcher's position as well. She she put it on record. She said it's very simple for the Scots to get independence. All they have to do is send a majority of MPs to Westminster. Well, that's what happened in 2015, 56 out of 59. That wasn't repeated in uh, 2017, but we still had a majority. Uh, it wasn't repeated in 2019, but we had still the majority. So we've now had three instances, three general elections, Westminster elections, where the SNP have won out the park. Absolutely yeah. killed yeah. the unionist parties, as, as far as Westminster is concerned. And then you add into the mix the uh, 2016 uh, uh, Scottish election and uh, the 2021 um, Scottish election. So we now have had five, five national elections where the party of independence has won. <laughs> and of course, it, it begs the question for those of us that believe in independence, 
Well, if you're winning all these elections, why have we not advanced any further? Why is the, the case for Indiref 2 not already been put on the agenda for an actual date? Uh, now, Alba's uh, formation just over a year ago, um, people obviously scoff at it. Um, the commentators and, and some of the SNP apparatchiks will uh, scoff at uh, Alba. However, what Alba has managed to do is they have drawn in a lot, Mark, of the key activists who used to be who used to be proponents of the SNP. I mean, people like Kenny McCaskill, um, former Justice Minister, someone yeah. who has got a, an impeccable reputation in terms of fighting for independence in Scotland. And never mind Alec uh, Salmond, who, let's remember, was the guy that got us the first referendum and we almost won it. Um, you know, these are not people who can be easily dismissed. And I think you're right. I think their presence has gave a bit of a breath on the neck of the SNP to the extent that they could not go away with an action any longer. So there was an announcement, as you know, last uh, uh, 10 days that uh, there was a paper produced about uh, comparisons between other smaller countries in comparison to our size, who have done much better than than the UK. Um, So from my point of view, that that, that was a start. You never, you said it's going to take place next year. Never said when, but Angus Robertson has since went on record as saying uh, that that October is a lately date. So from my point of view, my appeal to the wider independence movement now, Mark, and it's been an appeal that has been uh, also echoed by Alex Salmond, is let's unite the clans. Let, 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 let's put down any of our own internal divisions within the independence movement, and there have been several, but let's put them down just now and let's dust down the banners, let's get the T-shirts ironed, let's get the flags out again, and let's go on the streets, beginning in Bannockburn on Saturday. Let's have the annual uh, commemoration of, of Bannockburn and let's make it massive. We've got our own hope over fear. Rally on the 18th of September, a critical historical date, uh, eight years to the to the day since we had the first referendum. We're going to be meeting in George Square again for the Hope Over Fear rally for a yes to villa around the theme of it's time, three by 23. That, that that's, the, that's the theme of the uh, event in September 18th in George Square in Glasgow. So my appeal tonight, um, Mark, to all of the activists in and around the independence movement is let's remember why we got involved in the first place because we want to see our country independent. Now, there are issues that we can all disagree with um, about after independence. You know, I, I don't want a, a monarchy. I, I, I don't. I want our own currency. Um, I, I certainly don't want to be a member of NATO. These are questions which are important questions, but the vital question is get our independence first then we have referenda on those questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how do you see that going forward? I mean, in, in terms of, because uh, I'm just thinking about this in terms of like developing a constitution. Again, we'll be holding this uh, this uh, conference at the end of July, you know, empowering the nation. And how do you see making these important decisions? And, you know, but prior and because I remember in the 2014 referendum, there was a lot of reticence to say, oh, well, well, you know, we, we won't have a monarchy or we'll become a republic or we'll, we'll do this, we'll do that. And the idea that that would turn off, you know, certain voters. And uh, I think it's different now. And I'm just wondering how you see these things. Like, uh, you know, like uh, if they were, if, if, if the yes movement, you know, I don't know how it's going to go forward. But if the yes movement to say, OK, well, if we become independent, we're going to be a republic. We don't want the monarchy, blah, blah, blah. Would that turn off too many voters? And I understand your perspective on, you know, uh, you know, leave these questions to after. But. What do you think should be the mechanism for resolving these things, whether it's before or after the uh, the, the referendum? I would argue, Mark, that we have to recognise the one thing that unites us all. The one thing that unites us all is we want a way through Westminster. We, we, we believe that people in Scotland can make better decisions for Scotland. And if those decisions are made in Scotland, they will always be better than decisions made 400 miles away in Westminster. Westminster is broken. Westminster stinks to the high heavens 
of corruption, uh, of double dealing, of hypocrisy, of lies. I mean, come on. I can remember, Mark, you'll remember this as well. Debates during the 2014 referendum, when those of us on the yes side, we used to say, if we don't get our independence, we could end up with a right wing Tory government dragging people out of the European Union and being led by somebody as uh, mad as Boris Johnson. I remember it being said. And yeah. people yeah. on the no side would say, you're scaremongering. This is a disgrace. This is a disgrace. And of course, what has happened since in the last eight years is everything we warned about has happened. They have run mm -hmm. us into the ground economically. They've squeezed the working class with their austerity uh, policies. They've looked after the rich with their, their tax cuts. They've tried to scapegoat asylum seekers and introducing policies, disgusting, immoral policies. People seeking asylum in their country, oh, well, let's send them to Rwanda. Uh, uh, absolutely disgusting policies. And yet we're part of it. Well, I don't want to be part of it. So what I think we have to do, Mark, is we say the question has to be, first and foremost, are we independent? Yes or no? Then we have to accept that there are a number of questions thereafter. Should we be a republic? Yes, I say. Others might say no. We should have a slimmed down monarchy. I'm not interested in putting them on a diet of any sort. I just want rid of the monarchy. I don't believe we should have a monarchy in a modern uh, democracy. But that question could go to a referendum. Should we rejoin the European Union? I don't think we should. I think we should be in the uh, market. We should be in the, 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 the market that, that's similar to Norway and we should have trading relations with Europe. I don't think we need to join the European Union. I think the European Union has become more of a right-wing organisation. I don't want to join it. But others may wish to join it. So let's have a referendum. Um, should we um, in relation to our, our constitution, should we have a constitution? If so, what should that constitution be? Um, I remember uh, visiting Venezuela way back in 2003, and they had a massive participation in uh, 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 referendums to decide the new constitution. Now, if Venezuela can do yeah. why can't we here? Yeah, yeah, there was something in Chile recently. There was, they replaced, I believe, the they, same replaced, thing, yeah. the, yeah, they replaced the uh, Pinochet era uh, constitution as well. That's uh, right. And what what are your views on the the, the current rail strike? And uh, with Mick Lynch, who has been a become a very uh, popular, uh, you know, uh, you know, celebrity in, in a certain way because he's been so good at kind of you know. Uh, uh, you know, dismissing or, you know, refuting the, the interviews that he's been having. But of course, he's speaking to a larger issue of working class, uh, you know, values and, you know, something that really hasn't been seen for a long time in terms of, uh, you know, unions being, you know, you know, perceived in a, you know, a, you know, making a really cogent argument. Uh, how, how do you view everything with with regard to the rail strike and with Mick Lynch and the working class struggle more generally within the UK? Mark, I view Mick Lynch of the RMT as a massive breath of fresh air. At last, a, a man of clear integrity, of intellect, of honesty and courage that's prepared to speak truth to power. When he's asked about the danger of a wage rise for RMT workers leading to inflation, Mick is able to pierce that particular lie with a, a succinct fashion when he points out that the inflation, which is expected to hit 11%, it's already at over 9%, expected to hit 11%, uh, within the next couple of months. That inflation is not being driven by workers' wages because workers' wages have are lower now in real terms than they have been in the last 10 years. What is driving inflation is supply chain problems in relation uh, to the, the war in, in Ukraine and also and absolutely critically executive pay. Executive yeah. pay in the last two years has risen by 29%. I'm talking about the top 350 Financial Times Index companies in the UK, uh, Mark. The top 350, the average 
pay of executives has went from, from 2.01 million pounds a year to 2.59 million pounds a year. So when when people when these commentators talk about uh, inflation being driven by higher pay, what they're meaning is executive pay and the profiteering yeah. now. The Unite did the commission a fantastic report just came out last Friday. Absolutely ran ragged the argument that it's workers uh, uh, leading to inflation, workers pay leading to inflation. Profiteering by the big companies, the BPs, the shells, billions of pounds of profit, paying the shareholders, paying bonuses. That's what's driving inflation. If you want to yeah. cut inflation, yeah. cut profits, and cut the wages of the top executives. The idea that workers don't deserve a rate of pay in line with inflation is immoral. It's a disgrace because if you don't get a wage rise that is in rate with inflation, what you're getting is a wage cut. Let's call it what it is. It's a wage cut. And these damned MPs, they've not had a wage cut. I was looking in the last uh, uh, six, seven years, their average, their pay has went from around 60 odd to 82,000. You know, they've, they've went up by 30%. Well, why don't the workers get the yeah. same? If the MPs can look after themselves. Yeah. Why don't the workers get the same? And from my point of view, the thing is, the thing is this, this, drive inflation. This, this, this inflation is occurring, but no rage, wage um, raises have occurred. So how exactly. can you argue that exactly. wage raises are doing the inflation, even though they haven't occurred? They're only being asked for. It's just absolutely... It's insane, Mark. It's complete. I mean, is, what, what Mick has done in relation to his performances in the media is he's called them out. I mean, he, he's called these Tory spivs liars to their faces because that's what they've done. They, they come out with this line, right, oh, the awful. average wage of these strikers is 44,000. When in actual fact, what they're quoting is the average wage of a train driver. And quite right, that's what trained. It's a skilled job. It's a, a very, very intense job. I'm glad they're getting their average wage is 44,000. But that's not the average wage of the RMT strikers. The average wage of the RMT strikers is 31,000. The average medium wage in Britain is 34,000. So they're actually yeah. on wages less than the average median wage in the whole of Britain. And some of these damned uh, politicians and uh, presenters, I wish they would live in a wage of a, a worker and then ask the same questions because the truth is they couldn't live in those wages. They couldn't make ends meet. And Mick said something the other night which I think resonated with ordinary people. He said, we either bargain or we beg. Well, I'm yeah. telling you, yeah. workers should not beg. Bargain, yes. That's why you're in a trade union. And by the way, RMT workers are not going to be alone. There's going to be more people striking for, for higher pay. Local authorities, teachers, firefighters, other transport workers and the airlines. There's no doubt there's going to be a generalised uprising, uh, Mark. Why? Because the rich have been having it their own way for the last decade. They have yeah. made themselves yeah. more fat with the amount of engorgement they've been taken out the profits. I mean, it's insane and obscene the salaries that they're living on now. One wee figure, I just want to get this wee figure in. I looked sure. at this wee figure sure. and it made me sick. Um, Richie Sunak. Richie Sunak pays £12,500 a year to heat his personal swimming pool in his house. £12,500. 42% of British families live on less than 12500 so this Muppet, who is in charge of the, the purse strings, he pays more to heat his damn pool than 42% of the workers in Britain actually live on. That is unsustainable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and how do you view with, 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 with what happened to Julian Assange? Because he was in um, uh, he was in prison. And, well, he still is in prison, obviously. And he went through a, a you know, a, a court hearing in the UK uh, about extradition to the US. And apparently, um, Priti Patel, uh, so, so, so called, uh, signed that he would be extradited to the United States. And, um, you know, as I understand it, you know, he disclosed a huge amount of information about what the United States was doing in Iraq and 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 really and elsewhere, and just basically 
you know, completely, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, exposed what the Western powers were doing. And he may he will probably die in prison, you know, over this because he exposed the truth. How do you see it? And and what do you, and, uh, you know, I see it as what is fr what does press freedom mean anymore? If, if you get somebody who's going to basically get, very probably die in prison because he exposed, you know, the, the things that the U.S., government certainly didn't want to be disclosed. Mark, I, I would recommend to all of the viewers, please get the trial of Julian Assange, a book by Niels Melzer, who was the uh, UN um, special uh, rapporteur on torture, um, mm -hmm. who has clearly documented the torture that has been meted out to Julian Assange. Torture, mm -hmm by Britain, by Britain, a, a so-called democratic nation that has imprisoned a man for telling the truth, imprisoned a journalist for exposing the crimes of the powerful. Nothing, absolutely nothing that WikiLeaks has produced has ever been contradicted. No distortions. No lies. Everything that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have produced has been truth. Truth to power. And power doesn't like that because they were exposed in Afghanistan. They were exposed in Iraq. They've been exposed in Libya. What have they been doing? They've been committing war crimes. Crimes against humanity. Killing yep. innocent yep. people in our name. And our name and WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have shone a powerful light on that darkness. And for that crime, that man has been persecuted, imprisoned, and now effectively is getting sentenced to death. Because that's what being extradited to America means. That man is getting uh, sent to it's, it's, it's over. If he if he's goes to an American prison, it's it's over. It's over. I mean, because yeah. either. I mean, the psychiatric assessments of Julian has shown that the man has been largely broken mentally because of the way he's been treated. Um, there is a danger, a suicide danger, but regardless of that, he will not get out for the rest of his life. He, he will die in prison. For what? For telling the truth. How the hell do we get to a situation where we're jailing the truth tellers but we're giving awards to the war criminals like Tony Bloody Blair. He just got an award last week. He, he got some order of the garter, some of the highest British award. This is Where's a man who lied to us and took us to an illegal war, an illegal invasion that cost a million lives, and he gets a bloody award when someone like Julian Assange, who tells us the truth, is in Belmar's prison. It's a damn disgrace, Mark, a damn disgrace. And if we allow this to happen, journalism's finished. Journalism is finished. Do you, know, you know what Julian should do? Julian should claim immediately Russian citizenship. Russian yeah. citizenship. Because see, if this was a Russian, we'd be saying, this is a disgrace. I know. I mean, it's happening. This is, the, this is what Russia does. That's a tyrant in nation. It's absolutely disgraceful. There's no freedom for journalists. We should help this guy. Well, let, let's, let's put him in that position. Let's say that Julian was to adopt a Russian citizenship. Would we then be sending him down? We've got to say loud and clear, he's doing the very things that we are calling in other journalists in other parts of the world to do. Expose tyranny. Expose crimes. That's what he did. And instead of applauding him, we're persecuting him. And it's a, I, I, I'm, I'm so angry about it. Uh, uh, Stella, his wife, has... has held herself so high and, and, and been acted with so much dignity. But I, I would implore everyone watching, please, please sign the petition, send the letters, go to the demonstrations. Please stand up for Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Uh, and and what do you do you feel that the media have been playing down the impact of Brexit in an attempt to uh, d d d uh, diffuse the case for uh, independence? 
and uh, and 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 we can extend this uh, conversation also, of course, to the Northern Ireland Protocol, all of the difficulties that are going on with that, and po possible Ir Ir Irish uh, reunification. How do you see that the way that the you know the 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 the, the media is is portraying Brexit and you know, trying to dismiss Scottish independence or, you know, water it down, so to speak. Mark, I think we learned a, a very, very important lesson during the 2014 referendum. There were many people, um, I hate to use this term of being bloodied, uh, but they were bloodied during that referendum because old heads like me, old campaigners like me, I, I, I was there during the minor strike, I, I was campaigning. Um, in support of the miners in 84, 85. I was there during the anti-poll tax campaign. I campaigned against the poll tax in 88, 89, 90. I already knew the role that the media plays in society. The media is owned and controlled by the billionaires. And their role is quite clearly to promote and defend the British establishment, defend the status quo. Those that are very, very rich want to stay very, very rich. And that's why they buy newspapers. That's why they buy stations uh, and, and they promote media which defends the way things are. And that's what the media uh, is doing in relation to the Tories. This is a guy, let's remember, this is a guy who told everybody he had, remember it was a, an oven-ready Brexit. This yeah. oven-ready yeah. Brexit... Uh, seems to have been burnt, uh, you know, it's so often ready that they're now prepared to break international law to wrap it up, such yeah. as the unworkability of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And yet the media, uh, let, let's remember the role they played. The media attacked the likes of Jeremy Corbyn. They absolutely mm. assaulted this man. They, they accused him uh, insanely, insanely. I know Jeremy Corbyn, He's a lovely man. He's fought racism all his life, and not just in words, but in actions, been in the streets against the fascists, and yet he was accused of being an anti-Semite. Utter, utter nonsense. And yeah. they yeah. got together, the media, and they promoted a position to try and bring that man down. Now, me and Jeremy disagree on independence, although at least Jeremy's position was that it was up to the Scottish people to decide, and if the Scottish people vote for the SNP, then they're entitled to a second referendum. But in 2017, and we have to remember, Mark, this man with a very, very radical mm -hmm. manifesto, I don't know if you had a chance to read the Labour manifesto of 2017, it was extremely radical renationalisation of gas, of electricity, of water, of the transport industry, absolutely radical programme of redistribution of wealth. They get the biggest swing to the Labour Party since 1945. Mm -hmm. Corbyn yeah. came within 2,000 votes of winning the 2016 general election. And that's why the media and the British establishment had to crucify him by 2019. Yeah. Yeah. And your man Starmer, who is an absolute disgrace, disgrace. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I despise yeah. Boris Johnson. The, I, the whole idea, him, I know well, the he, whole idea that he he's saying uh, to uh, to front benchers, you better not go on the uh, on the picket lines with those strikers or you'll be sanctioned. What? Aren't you a labor party? Isn't the labor, you know, you're the labor party. So you're supposed to support labor. I mean, it's just insane the, you Mark, know, and, you know, I mean, it was it was in if you think about it, it's in his name, isn't it? So yeah. dear Starmer. Yeah. Now, how can you have a Labour leader who's a sir? It's an oxymoron. <laughs> you can't have somebody who's in the Labour Party is also a sir. He is part and parcel of the British establishment. He will yeah. never uh, in any way, shape or form uh, threaten the British establishment. He gave 10 pledges when he stood for the leadership after Jeremy Corbyn. And all of those pledges, every one of them have been broken. Uh, he said he was going to stay the course with the manifesto that he fought the election in 2017 on. And this, this gets me, Mark, it really gets me. Jeremy Corbyn in 2017 said, I'm not for Brexit, but 
England has voted for it. So what we're saying is vote Labour and we'll get a Labour Brexit and we'll, we'll fight to keep consumer rights, um, workers' rights uh, and some of the healthy parts of the European Union. Labour came within 2,000 votes of winning. Yeah. Starmer yeah. gets invited into the cabinet, shadow cabinet, and he comes up with this plan. You know, I don't think we should accept Brexit. What we should say is now we want another Brexit. We, we want another uh, yeah. vote. Yeah. Let's ignore and, 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 what the people And just the other day, and that just was the other Starmer's day. policy. And, and, and unfortunately, and, and, I love Jeremy to bits, but he's soft. He's too soft because he allowed himself to be bullied yeah, by I, these I people. Agree. I mean, I think... I, I always uh, I thought that I loved his ideas and the things that he wanted to do, but he just wasn't he wasn't up for it. You know, I don't know what it, I don't know what it means to be up for it, to go against the British state, you know, which is a lot. But, uh, you know, well, I the, thought the, it, the surprising thing is, Mark, Jeremy is, in my opinion, prepared to take on the British state. Uh, but Jeremy used to make a, a point at his, uh, his rallies and it was a fantastic point. He says at his rallies, the British establishment isn't afraid of me. They're afraid of you. <laughs> and, and he was right, because there was thousands and thousands going to his rallies. But yeah. where Jeremy let himself down, because he's a basically beautiful human being, is he saw the best in everybody. And while he was seeing the best in everybody, they were scheming behind his back and stabbing him uh, left, right and centre, uh, trying to undermine him, trying to bring him down. And unfortunately, they succeeded. Um, and Labour, Labour are finished in Scotland. Their Labour are going nowhere in Scotland. Um and unfortunately for the English working class, there, there's, there's no Labour Party, there's no alternative. I mean, the Tories will probably lose the by-elections tonight. Uh, Labour might win one by default because there's, there's no another party to vote for. Uh, Tories will lose the other one to the Liberals, in my opinion, that they'll lose two seats tonight. But if you're going into an election with Starmer at its head, why would you go and vote for him? If, you know, <laughs> if you're going to vote Tory, you may as well vote for the first Tories instead of the second Tories. Because I, I saw Starmer as a Tory. Yeah, exactly. He's so he's so established. It, it, it's a very similar story with Bernie Sanders as well. You know, I mean, he was running and he ran in 2016 and 2020, but the 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 Democratic establishment, neoliberal Democratic establishment, moved against him and and blocked him successfully. Blocked him. Okay, fine, great, you won. But now we got Joe Biden and well, if it's interesting, actually, it unites two of our stories here, Mark, because. Sure. The, 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 the truth about Bernie Sanders is only truth because of WikiLeaks. <laughs> we, we wouldn't know about the machinations of the Democratic Party if WikiLeaks hadn't released some of the emails and communications which showed that Bernie Sanders was going to win the nomination. And what the Democratic Party did is they discounted votes. They made sure that enough votes were discounted so that Bernie didn't win the nomination and Hillary Clinton uh, won the nomination. I mean, that, that's, that's just that's what they did. That's, and it's fact. They can't deny it. They also yeah. can't deny Hillary Clinton cheering when uh, Colonel Gaddafi is, is sodomised uh, in, 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 in front of people, you know, literally sodomised. Um, and she cheers. And, and yet we're supposed to believe that this woman is somebody that should be entrusted with your vote. She is a bigger war uh, 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 criminal than Blair, in my opinion, and, and he's a big war criminal. So how the American people could be expected to, be, to be blamed for what happened with the election of Trump, I tell you what, I spoke to a lot of ordinary Americans and they said to me, Tommy, the choice um, was either to, to, to be hung or, 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 or to, to, to be shot. It, it, it was just a no choice because they were just as bad as each other. Yeah, yeah. OK. And what is your uh, what is the no nature of your continued involvement with Hope, uh, Hope Over Fear and your events in George Square? And how do you see that going forward? Uh, one of the questions was whether this would be your last year uh, with Hope Over Fear. Uh, what's your what's your future with that, uh, uh, with, with Hope Over Fear? Mark, th th this actually links back to the, to the original question where we started, because um, if you remember back to 2013, the SNP produced a, a white paper, and this white paper was the sort of a um, scaffolding upon which the yes vote was to be promoted. The problem with this scaffolding uh, was it was pretty bare. Um, it, it didn't say anything about um, a, a democratic republic. It didn't say anything about uh, our own currency. It didn't say anything about 
uh, future in the European Union. It didn't say anything about NATO. Um, and therefore, there were a number of problems for people like me. I, I'm a socialist and there are a lot of socialists in Scotland and um, even left of centre, if, if people don't even call themselves socialists, certainly left of centre. And the reason hope over fear was established is because we felt we needed a socialist yes campaign. We needed to uh, make the campaign more radical. Uh, and therefore, we fought um, the uh, campaign on a clear programme of saying, after independence, we want a democratic republic. We want to get away from the warmongering NATO. We, we want to have our own currency. We want to have our own bank. We don't want to be a Bank of England to have anything to do with an independent uh, Scotland. Um, and that was very successful in reaching parts of Scotland that, quite frankly, the official campaign wasn't reaching. Getting working class communities, former Labour voters in particular, people who had a left of centre attitude. I think we touched those parts. I did 121 meetings during that uh, year long campaign and they were very, very successful. We mobilised uh, hundreds and, and tens of thousands, in packed meetings, two and three meetings uh, a day. Um, and we managed, I think, to raise the sights of what an independent Scotland was about. It wasn't just about changing the flags. You know, I, I, want, I, I don't recognise the, the butcher's apron as my flag. I, I, I recognise the St Andrew's flag as my flag. But see if all we did was change the flag, but we didn't change the pension. We didn't change the minimum wage. We didn't change workers' rights. We didn't change public services. Then why have independence? If, if, we're, if we're going to be the same or worse... Uh, than what we are the now, then why change? I think it's important and vital that we promote progressive change through independence. And Hope Over Fear was formed um, in, 2000, in late 2013. It campaigned all the way through. Um, and we then had our first big major Glasgow rally in October of 2014. And it, we, we did it because people were down. September 18th, we were all down. Um, people, uh, you know, we, we felt as though our hopes had been dashed. We called people to the square. We had thousands yeah. of people turned up. And we made a commitment then, Mark. We will come back every September as near to the 18th as possible until we get our independence. And we've done it. The only two years that we haven't been there were the COVID years. And we, we did that because we respected yeah. the, 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 the call not to... Uh, assemble to, to defend our NHS, so we, we did we, we didn't assemble in those two years. But we're back this year, and we're, we're the very significant date is 18th of September, Mark. It's Sunday, 18th September. So it's eight years to the day since we had a referendum. We're going to be in George Square, and it's going to be a yesterval. We're going to have even <laughs> even more live music and performers. We're going to have some um, keynote speakers. We're inviting all of the independence parties to be there. Hopefully, they'll come along. Uh, and hopefully we'll mobilise thousands. Now, if the referendum is before next September, then it probably will, it will be our last. But the, the word is that it's going to be next October. So it looks like we'll have at least one more assembly <laughs> in, in uh, George Square before we actually get a freedom. Okay. And, and what would you say to people who are, you know, support independence, who I think, you know, are despondent, uh, don't see the action, you know, taken that they would that they feel necessary. Okay, yes, the Scottish government has said yes, we'll have this one in October of 2023. Blah 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 blah. Um, what, what's your what's your rousing statement to people to keep the faith and to keep on with it? And uh, could, because a, a lot of people have a lot of doubts about, you know, what, are, is this going to be challenged? And is a referendum going to be challenged in court? What's going to happen? Is it going to be relevant? Is it going to be denied or you know, totally ignored by the British government? You know, how do you, what would you say to people just to keep, keep the faith? Well, at the very, very least, Mark, this whole legal debate should have been in court by now. In my opinion, the decision to delay the campaign for independence and postpone it was wrong. Um, mm -hmm. People within the SNP leadership say uh, we couldn't pursue independence because of COVID. Personally, I think that was a reason to pursue independence because 
this idea of let's recover from COVID. Well, how can we recover in the union? We can't recover because yeah. what you've got yeah. is a horribly divided, unequal society where carers and nurses and other ordinary workers are paid buttons while investment bankers and all of your spivs are getting paid millions. That is the union. How can you recover in a, a, a system like that? You can't recover like that. The way to recover is through independence, where we have more equity. We have a fairer society. We share out our, our wealth. We have more public ownership. We make sure that we look after ordinary workers and pensioners. We give everyone a decent standard and quality of life. So I, I think it was wrong to postpone the, the, the campaign. However, it's supposed to be back on. Well, I say this. Either we have a legal referendum next year. If that doesn't happen, then the next general election has to be categorically a vote for SNP is a vote to separate Scotland from the mess of Westminster. In other words, it is like a, 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 an independence referendum, but by an election. And if people yeah. vote yeah. SNP, they know what they're doing. They're voting for separation. They're voting to build a new, and a better and a fairer independent Scotland. And that must be made categorically uh, clear to people. I think a referendum would be brilliant. I, I want another referendum next year. But if the SNP are going to prevaricate about saying, oh, well, uh, the court are saying it's no legal. Let me say, how can it not be legal? Come on, Mark, we're in a voluntary union. This isn't something um, that is anything other than a union of 1707 that was entered into by two independent nations. Scotland was an independent nation. England was an independent nation. They decided to form a voluntary union. Now, it was done against the wishes of the people of Scotland behind their back without any democratic input. We know all of that. But if you voluntarily entered into something, how could you possibly not voluntarily leave that union via a democratic referendum yeah. within yeah. the country that has joined that union. I, I, legally, it is complete and utter nonsense to suggest that we don't have the sovereign right to decide our future. Now, if the people in Scotland vote again to stay within Westminster, then that's up to them. You know, I, I, I mean, I'll be so sad, I'll be so angry, um, I'll be so disappointed, but if they do that, that's, that's their democratic right. In 2014, I've got to remind people, we started off at 23%. That's what we were when the uh, referendum uh, gun was fired. That's why David Cameron gave us the bloody yes vote, because he thought we well, were going to get absolutely dubbed. We went from 23 to 45. We nearly won it. This time around, we're not starting at 23. We're starting at 50. <laughs> we're starting 50-50 here. Yeah. I, don't, I yeah. don't think there's any way, shape or form yeah. we're not going to win this which is why Johnson and the British establishment yeah. don't want to give us it. If they don't want to give us it, we take it. We don't say to them, please, can we vote on our future? We say to them, we are voting on our future, and the date is, whether it's October, September, they can work that out for themselves. Let's not ask for the crumbs from the British table. Let's tell them we're taking out the bloody bakery. That's the way we've got to approach this whole question. And, and what, why do you, how do you explain the reticence or the, the, the cautiousness of the Scottish government? Because, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I have my issues with uh, Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish government, but I don't <coughs> doubt that they do want independence, but they seem so skittish and they seem, and I remember seeing an interview with uh, Mike Russell uh, at least a year or so back, and he said something like, you have no idea what we're up against you know, referring to the British state, like you just don't know what we're, you know, we're dealing with in terms of the British state. And uh, you having dealt with the British state in different ways over the years, what do you think they are up against? Why is it that there is this kind of skittishness? Like, you know, what is this huge force that would come down on them if, you know, if they pursued independence in a more direct manner, in your view? Mark, I, I need to remind all of the SNP elected parliamentarians, people like me, I, I, I got criticised in 2015 by socialist comrades. Um, I actually lost 
members of I was in solidarity, I was a convener of solidarity at the time, and uh, members of uh, our party left because I, along with others within solidarity, believed that what we had to do in the 2015 general election was unite the yes vote. The unionists had done it at the referendum. They united the no vote. We had to unite the yes vote behind the SNP. And I campaigned um, for an SNP vote in 2015, 2017, and 2019. And I campaigned in 2015 under a very, very clear slogan. We're sending you down there to settle up, not to settle down. I'm afraid far too many of the SNP parliamentarians have forgot that principle. They've forgot that maxim. Far too many of them have mm -hmm. settled down. I, I hear stories about the wanting on to uh, X, Y and Z committees. Uh, they want to serve on this or that uh, board and they want to do this or that motion. I couldn't give a damn about the way Westminster works. I want us out of Westminster we should be making Westminster unworkable, not making it more workable. For God's sake, SNP members, you're there to get Scotland out of the union, not to make Scotland a better part of the union. So do your job. Lead us out of this horrible, corrupt, rotten Westminster system. Get your slippers off and get your Doc Martens on, and let's get marching out of Westminster. Yeah, yeah. And and how, and what do you? I mean, I, I think your 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 views are, I'm sure, very clear on this. But uh, how do you see? You know, once independence is achieved in whatever way, I know you want to see Scotland as a more socialist country. How do you see that happening? You know, how, you know, because of course, if, if it's just, you know, there's independence and then, um, and then it's, just, and, and Scotland just becomes another Westminster, it'll, it'll be of a total waste. I mean, there's, there, what's the point? Uh, but what do you see as the major fundamental changes that need to be made in an event of Scotland? And, you know, I, I don't expect a total answer on this, but how do you see these as being achieved? You know, things like, you know, monarchy, currency, you know, uh, you know, becoming a republic, these types of things. How do you see these decisions being made? You know, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you on everything pretty much. But, uh, you know, how do you see these decisions being made? You know, Mark, in, I'm a big fan the... of referenda. I, 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 as long as there is um, fair referenda, as long as there is equal uh, status for, for the arguments um, in terms of, of media space so that those of uh, after independence, those of us that will argue for a democratic republic will be given the same length of time as those that say, no, no, uh, we should say subservient uh, to a family who was lucky to be born into a particular line uh, and they should have more power over everybody else because of who they were born into. You know, they're welcome to have 50% of the time to tell us that. I think we win that particular argument. Um, there may be older people who have got nostalgia uh, about the royal family. I think it's a horribly <laughs> dysfunctional <laughs> family of, of scroungers. Uh, when, when people talk about getting tough with scroungers, you hear politicians say that all the time. I wish they would get tough with the big scroungers in Britain, which is, of course, the royal family. Uh, that's, they're the real scroungers. Uh, but let's have that debate after independence. Let's have the debate about NATO. I think NATO is an aggressive warmongering alliance that is nowhere near uh, required in the modern era. Uh, it, it is there to promote America's imperialism. It is a tool of America. It's a poodle of America. Uh, I believe uh, what it did in Yugoslavia was a complete and utter disgrace and, and war crime. What, what it uh, failed to do in, in Iraq, what it's did in Afghanistan, what it's did in Libya, all of that has destabilised the world and made it a worse place uh, to live in. So I don't want to be a member of NATO. Uh, let's have a referendum on it. Uh, we've already uh, got an agreement, I believe, on unilateral nuclear disarmament. That should never have to be revisited again. 
Um, one of the strongest arguments that I get a response for in 2014, I said, look, forget all the other arguments, currency, pensions, wages, forget all those arguments for a moment and think of two arguments, just two arguments. Number one, in an independent Scotland, there'll not be another Tory government. We've not had yeah. Scotland hasn't voted Tory since 1955. We're not going to have another Tory government. Yeah, that's a great reason to vote independence. But here's the other great reason to vote independence. Nuclear disarmament. Scotland, yeah. this wee nation of ours, standing up in the world stage and saying, these weapons are immoral. They are illegal. We are not prepared to host them any longer. We are decommissioning them or we're sending them to where they belong, the River Thames, right outside Westminster. That's, <laughs> if they want to keep their nuclear weapons, let them keep them right on the Westminster. Uh, 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 so that if there's ever any attack on our weapons, we know what building will be the first to go. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, well, we'll be wrapping this up uh, pretty pretty soon. And uh, but, but what would you like to say, just again, in terms of, you know, just keeping the faith and and uh, keeping people, you know, positive about independence because it's it's very difficult right now. We've got the SNP with their sexual scandals and all the you know the, the gender identification crap and you know stuff that I don't even want to think about, let alone kind of talk about. But um, how do you see beyond that? And what do you what would you say to our viewers? And just in terms of seeing beyond the the, the crap that that is going on right now, and seeing for uh, towards a uh, towards an in, in independent Scotland. Uh, Mark, I'm going to make a wee confession to you. I, I was invited to take part in the um, campaign. We've got a Germans for Yes movement that's been going for years, and uh, I've, I've visited Berlin and I spoke at uh, a couple of of the marches, and they do a fantastic job. And they had. Um, a, a recent uh, Zoom rally um, just a, a few weeks ago, and I was asked to contribute to it. And I was very honest with Raymond, the, the one of the organisers, uh, Raymond Dijkstra, and I said to him, Next Raymond, week. I'm sorry, I can't contribute because my contribution would be negative. It would be negative, and I don't want it to be negative. Because at that time, Mark, there had been no announcement about the paper and the timetable, and the idea of next year. I am thoroughly, thoroughly enthused now that we, there seems to be progress. And I know a lot of people are saying, yeah, but it's empty and it's shallow and, and, and it doesn't amount to much because there's no facts and there's no actual date yet. I know all of that. Forgive me my naivety here. What I'm going to say to you is, we need to lead from the back. We need to be the fuel which forces the SNP to take decisive decisions on Indy Ref 2. We need to be the ones who say, no, we don't beg, just like Mick Lynch said about the RMT strikers, we don't beg for the right to have Indy Ref 2. We tell them we are having Indy Ref 2 because it's our sovereign right to have Indie Ref 2. And we need to be the foot soldiers who push that forward, Mark. And until this uh, announcement in the last 10 days, I was worried that we weren't going anywhere. I think there's now a direction. I think the SNP felt the enormous pressure. People were saying to them, eh, wait a minute, you can't have uh, uh, any more online conferences that you can control very easily. You're going to have to have a physical conference. And I think the rank and file of the SNP are going to go to physical conferences and they're going to be saying, hey, what happened to the seven mandates? They've got seven bloody mandates for independent F2. Where are they? Why are we not using them? And that's why there's been announcements recently to the effect that there's going to be a referendum next year. Um, so I would appeal, Mark, appeal to the wider movement. I think we have been fragmented. I think we've been divided. I think we've been bruised. No doubt about it. But you know what? We need to pick ourselves up and we need to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture, the bigger prize is independence. It's independence for a country and a fairer and a better Scotland. I'm like you 
uh, Mark. I don't think independence is the stop. Independence is the start. You know, it's not the end of the journey. It's the start oh, yeah. of the journey. But exactly. that journey, that journey, the opportunity to make something better, but it Scotland, doesn't. Prevent. We can't start that journey until we get independence. So that's my appeal to the the wider movement. There, please let's pick up our banners and our placards and our posters and our t-shirts and let's get back out in the streets and let's unite with people in a common cause. Unite the clans. Let's go for independence. Okay, thank you, and uh, and I encourage everybody to attend the uh, the conference at the end of uh, July in Dumfernland, uh, where we will be trying to figure out how to go forward, uh, especially if you know, given the uncertainty of the uh, of the uh, of the referendum plans uh, being put out by Nicola Sturgeon. But anyway, anyway, so uh, unless there's anything else you want to add, Tommy, thank you so much for being with us. I, I just want to, 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 to say to you, Mark, you and Paul and everyone else in, involved with Independence Live and building the Scottish State Show, these shows, uh, the, the bloggers out there uh, that do a hard job and they keep the, the cause going, um, Let's stay positive. Let's stay positive. Let's try and unite everybody. But you are more essential now than ever because this next 12 months is going to be critical. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, I'll be here. I'll be here. Okay. So thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Tommy, for being with us this evening. Thanks for the invite. All right.